So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to the June lecture of the British Institute for the Study of Iraq. Uh, my great pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon. My apologies for um, the late start. As you may have gathered, there's a slight technical issue, but now all solved and we're ready to go. So it's uh, uh, my great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, this afternoon's speaker, uh, someone I think, as is so often said uh, in lectures of this type, who needs no introduction, and I think in this case it is probably very true, um, a great friend, of course, of the British Institute, not least because uh, until a year and a half ago uh, she was the chair of trustees, um, chair of council for the Institute. Uh, is, of course, uh, Professor Eleanor Robson. Uh, just a few words then for those of you who don't know Eleanor um, or need reminding of her great achievements. Uh, she is Professor of Ancient Middle Eastern History uh, at University College London, the particular focus on Iraq. Uh, she joined UCL in 2013 after 10 years of teaching in the Department of the History and Philosophy of Science at the University of Cambridge. And then uh, before that, she spent um, many years at the University of Oxford, and her work um, really revolves around three principal themes, the social and political context of knowledge production in cuneiform culture of ancient Iraq, the construction of knowledge about ancient Iraq in Europe, the Americas, and the Middle East over the past two centuries, and the use of open standards-based online resources for democratizing access to knowledge about the Middle East. She's published widely. I mean, her major publications include the award-winning Mathematics in Ancient Iraq, A Social History, 2014. And she was uh, the editor with Karen Radner of the Oxford Handbook of Cuneiform Culture. And it is in many ways combining all those aspects today that uh, she'll be talking about her latest uh, initiative, leading uh, the story in connecting people in the past in post-conflict Iraq, introducing to us the Nahrain Network. Uh, Eleanor Robson. Uh, thank you, Paul, for that lovely introduction. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's lovely to be here again. Um, Paul has been slightly disingenuous in saying, introducing to us, because as you will see, he knows this very well, because he is um, one of the, uh, the, the co-directors of the project, and uh, the British Institute for the Study of Iraq is one of the, the project's partners. So I'm going to do three, uh, three or four things tonight. First of all, I'm going to explain a little bit about how the project came about, logistically and intellectually. I'm going to um, describe a bit about what we've been doing since we set up last October. If I have time, I want to um, talk to you about some of the work I did in Baghdad last April with uh, young cultural heritage professionals um, and thinking their understandings of their relationship to the past in Iraq. Um, and then I'll finish off by telling you a little bit about how you um, might get involved as well. So. so, our remit is to um, essentially think about how the past and how the humanities disciplines can help uh, re-energise Iraq um, in this post-conflict situation. And by post-conflict, I don't just mean the war against Daesh over the last few years, but of course, that long aftermath of the 2003 war, the terrible years of Saddam, all of that brutality, um, violence, has left the country very um, damaged socially, economically, psychologically. And what we want to do is think about how the sorts of skills that we have can help Iraq develop for the better in the future. So we're funded by um, government funds that have come to us as a rather uh, indirect route. So if you cast your mind back to the heady days of 2015, when the world was a much simpler place, pre-Brexit, pre-Trump, um, and then run up to the 2015 general election, when the coalition was still in power, it seems a long time ago now, doesn't it? The, um, the Conservative Party, in their election manifesto, made a commitment 
to spend um, 0.7% of gross domestic product on what the, um, the United Nations defines as official development assistance. That is, overseas aid that is targeted towards sustainable development and is mostly spent in the country. So when they got elected, blow me down, they actually stuck to that promise. Many, as we know, many manifesto promises don't get delivered, but this one did. And the new government realised that actually 0.7% of this country's uh, GDP is an awful lot of money. And although it comes initially through the, um, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, it ended up getting spread over many different government departments, most obviously uh, the Department for International Development, but perhaps most interestingly for us, two other government departments, um, DCMS, Department for Digital, Culture, Media and Sport, and they fund a, a fund that you've probably heard of called the Cultural Protection Fund, and that is to support the, the physical safeguarding of material cultural heritage in um, in post-conflict places, particularly in North Africa and the Middle East. So a couple of projects that um, BZ is um, involved with in various ways um, are funded through that. But a lot more money went to what used to be called Research Councils UK, and since April is now called UK Research and Innovation, UCRI, which is the body that funds the university research across um, the country. So the idea is, this was £2 billion, no, possibly more, that was given to, to distribute to university research projects across the country to think about how uh, academic research can really understand what development means, what sustainability can do, and how the sorts of skills that we academics normally put to work in our own countries can be made valuable and meaningful in, as um, ODA defines it, lower and middle income countries and also fragile states. And there are various technical definitions about what these sorts of countries are. And Iraq is most definitely, um, certainly in the, in the, uh, the uh, middle income bracket and certainly um, by many definitions fragile. So that's, the, that's the, um, the sort of the big um, institutional framework, if you like, that um, our project has to be research. We can't, we're not just going out and trying to do good. We have to be generating new knowledge. Um, but we also, it has to be new knowledge for immediate, demonstrable, sustainable good. So this is a major challenge. So when the funding calls were announced, um, well actually just before the funding calls were announced, um, we at, at BZ, when I still had my BZ hat on, had organised, um, you may remember, a conference, a workshop in Basra to celebrate the opening of the new Basra Museum, which many people in this room are very closely involved with. And um, I was there, obviously, Paul... And we first met for the first time um, the then new head of UNESCO Iraq, Louise Haxthausen. And we were having some interesting conversations then about... This was just at the point that the Cultural Protection Fund was starting up and there was money to preserve physical cultural heritage across the Middle East and North Africa. And so we were talking about, well, what happens when this stuff is preserved? Who is responsible for looking after it, for making meaning for it? How can this be made to work sustainably in the long term? So we were already having conversations around these questions when the opportunity to bid for funding came up. And you can see, I'm sure um, those of you who are my age and older will recognise at least three people in this photograph. Those of you who are younger than me might recognise at least two. So these were some of the sort of intellectual and also um, personal and ethical inspirations behind the project. So Jeremy Black, who passed away, um, uh, gosh, 2004, was my doctoral supervisor at Oxford when I was a student. He was also um, a former field director of what was then the um, British School of Archaeology in Iraq. And I kind of grew up, as it were, with him 
um, thinking primarily about his work in relation to his Iraqi colleagues. And all through the 1990s, he was very committed to um, helping uh, colleagues in Iraq survive those terrible years of sanctions. And as soon as it was possible to return to Iraq, what was a return for him was, was very much my first visit. So I very much learned from him at a time when it was po impossible to, to go to Iraq that although I was studying a very ancient place, it was a real living place and it was populated by people who were experts in it, what for them was their local history and that was really important. You may also remember um, John Curtis who was then um, in 2003 um, Keeper of the Middle East Department at the British Museum, who was one of the, or was really the first person to get on a plane and go and help the Iraq Museum after the 2003 war. And to, to again, people first. So for both of them, both Jeremy and, and John, I learned from a very early age that working with Iraqi colleagues and respecting Iraqi colleagues and prioritizing them was, was important. And then over the past few years, and since it's been, um, uh, Iraq has um, become a, a, a more uh, a safer place, a more uh, a, um, easier place to work. Um, while I was chair of the institute, um, oh, sorry, I've jumped ahead. They don't want to see him yet. Uh, let's focus on Jane. Much nicer thought. Jane Moon. Again, <coughs> I'm sure you've been to hear, hear her talk about. The, the, the amazing project she's led in the southern Iraq, and I was she was a pioneer in really in returning international field work to, to the country, and I was fortunate enough to be the epigrapher on her project, and again learned a lot from her about I was just meeting a lot of people and thinking about the ethics of, of, of what we're doing and why we're doing it and who we're doing it for most importantly. And then, I doubt any of you will know this man, but this is Ahmed Zaini, who is a mathematician, an Iraqi mathematician. Um, Paul mentioned my book on the history of um, the social history of mathematics in ancient Iraq. At the time um, that it came out, Ahmed was teaching um, in the women's college at the University of Baghdad. And he just emailed me out of the blue and said, wow, your book is amazing. You get it. I've got it. I completely understand it. Why don't you come to a big international conference on mathematics in Iraq and talk about the ancient history of mathematics? This was about 2012, 2013, and I was like, hell yeah, sure. So that was brilliant, and I did, and you can see me there in the background being interviewed for Iraqi TV. It turned out I was the international component of the conference. But, but again, that was that Ahmed taught me that actually, you know, I could, I could be in Iraq on my own, um, and what I had to do was basically trust my local colleagues um, about where we're safe and what we could do. You know, Ahmed and, and his mates took me to Nippur, for instance. Um, I think that time, Lamia and I also, um, we went to, um, to Karbala. Um, yeah, it was really, so Najaf, wasn't it? Um, Karbala was another visit. Um, so, yeah, so I had all these models in my head about, about what needed to be done, and Ahmed really taught me very... Um, explicitly how isolated Iraqi academia was at that point. So when the, yeah, so those are the sort of background things. And then when the, the funding call was announced and Paul and, and Louise and I at one, in one sort of corner of my world and then you know, Ahmed and my Iraqi colleagues in another corner of my world were having these conversations about Iraqi academia. <laughs> My friend, Juliet, oh gosh, Boris, go away. You won't be your time soon. Um, Juliette Depla, who is the um, head of, um, of overseas archives in the National, uh, the National Archives here in London in Kew, but she is a historian of Egyptology and we've been working together on various sort of student-related projects on the history of Middle Eastern archaeology. And she said to me, wow, you've seen this funding call, you've got to apply it, your work is, is, is right up the street. And then at that point, Moody Rashid, who had not long uh, graduated with a doctorate from Oxford and was feeling like her academic work ought to be more socially engaged as well. So in the, it was late 2016, these two young women were my inspiration for really forcing me into applying for this funding. So, okay, that's enough of the sort of self-indulgent uh, thanks, but really I think you know, it's very important to, to recognise those deep roots. 
So, though that's the good stuff, the other stuff is the, is the, is the political impotence, the things that had sort of driven me bonkers at the time, and you can probably all remember this too. So, um, here, um, this was early 2015, um, March 2015, after the first uh, videos that Daesh released of um, their destructions at Nimrud and then the uh, Mosul Museum. And certain, certain discourses came out in the British media that were focused very much on the fact that it was the destruction of objects ancient objects that was the tragedy that should move people into really driving Daesh out of Iraq. The fact that already Mosul had been occupied and many other parts of the country for nine months by this point, we knew that people were being thrown off buildings on suspicion of homosexuality, people were being burnt alive, having their hands cut off for the most terrible things. None of that seemed to provoke certain politicians, but the destruction of antiquities. Um, got, um, was suddenly got international attention. And the idea was, as you can see here, perhaps, some of this is a rather low reg there's image, that, um, it, that this represented humanity's shared history. Now, this was before Johnson became our foreign minister. He was still just a, a telegraph hack at this point. But nevertheless, I mean, you know, that, it was a very, very powerful moment. But it wasn't just a, a, a conservative view from the other side of the spectrum. In The Guardian, Jonathan Jones, who is their long-term art correspondent, and notice art rather than history, um, got exercised just a day later when the news came out that, um, that Daesh had destroyed Saddam's tomb. And the, the recent news about the the, the uh, destruction in the Northwest Palace in Nimrud had turned into Jonathan Jones' mind into the entire Assyrian Empire had been destroyed. And he says again, you probably can't read this here, Islamic State cowards have destroyed the Assyrian Empire, but the world's media glare is on a concrete mausoleum. Only our museums, by that he means museums in Britain, have the guts to protect our precious art history. So Iraq's Heritage becomes ours. It becomes art rather than functional objects. And again, there is no mention of the people in the country who might, who might need saving or might have a view on all of this. And this is very simple dichotomy here. As I put it. He, in his view, you know, and it's also, it's also very explicit in Johnson's article as well, that there are no local um, solutions to saving uh, heritage, which is entirely material heritage, and either objects should be safe in the West, and ideally in both of their views in the British Museum, or they're left for destruction um, by terrorists. And this con concept that there might be local expertise, local experts, local people who, perhaps not experts, but who, who love and cherish their stuff and want to keep it, was completely out of the discourse at this time. Um, you know, I remember I've been, you know, with Jane and with my Iraqi colleagues travelling to Iraq a lot and seeing how completely untrue this simple, simplistic dichotomy was. And the hilarious thing was that actually all of this was simply opportunistic uh, ranting to, to, make, to make a point. So here's Jonathan Jones, ex almost exactly a year before, in March 2014, when the British Museum had uh, ha ha hosted a temporary exhibition um, around this uh, ancient Assyrian artifact. Um, and at this point, just exactly a year before, Jones had been on a big rant and, um, about how the, the British Museum shouldn't be wasting its time on pointless Assyrian artifacts which were not civilised. And he ended his article with this uh, two sentences. Egypt and Greece were civilizations, Assyria was not. So at, his, at that point, Assyria was not worth saving, but only when it became um, threatened by, um, by evil Middle Eastern terrorists did it become our precious art history. So you can see these things just changing on a whim. It's entirely opportunistic. And then I think as a response to this very hysterical media um, 
environment, the, the government very quickly put some of that official development assistance money into the Cultural Protection Fund, created this, um, which was already, yeah, which began, as a, had a soft start in 2015 and then became open to, to um, bids for projects um, in early 2016. And the Cultural Protection Fund is, serves a very valuable role in funding, it has £30 million, but it explicitly is designed, as it says, to keep cultural heritage sites and objects safe, as well as recording, conserving and restoring cultural heritage. So for the Cultural Protection Fund, heritage lies in things, in material objects. It also relies, uh, resides in... Um, intangible heritage, but frustratingly for a historian, it doesn't reside in written heritage. There is nowhere in the Cultural Protection Fund where someone like me, who is a historian, can make a case for um, preserving the, the, the written um, heritage of, of the country. And it also acknowledges that there are local people involved, but those people are there to be trained and educated. They are not themselves, in the Cultural Protection Fund's language, experts themselves. So the expertise comes from the international community who comes in and helps local people um, and so solve, solve problems. And of course all those decisions about what is worth saving are made here in the UK, not in Iraq. So for me this was all a little bit out of kilter. So that's all a very long-winded way of saying that when our team got together the idea was to turn that on its head and to enable um, Iraqi expertise, um, Iraqi ideas um, come to fruition, help people find their voices, help those voices be heard, help sort of meet the gap between ambition and realisation. So facilitation, advocacy, support... Um, really being driven by what um, colleagues in Iraq want. So, sorry, my slides are slightly out of order here. So, as I said, it's a network, and the idea is to build um, relationships. So, I mentioned Paul as one of... Um, and, the, and Paul's expertise in museums was really important because I'm very much a, um, a historian of, of ideas, as you've heard, um, and then originally, uh, the third senior member of our team was Saad Iskander, whom you all know very well, I think, um, a long-term friend of the Institute's former di uh, director of the Iraq National Library and Archives. Um, he was with us for the first six or seven months of the project, um, dropped out for a while, and we are in the process of re-involving him in ways that I'm not quite allowed to say yet, but um, he will be back on the team very soon. And then our fourth member of our team is um, uh, Dr. Mehdi Al-Khazam here, who is also um, British Iraqi. And he did his PhD at SOAS on the various ways in which big international aid projects in Iraq have failed since uh, 2003. So he's our sort of great um, secret weapon in ensuring that actually more or less we're going to do okay, because he knows all about all the various ways in which things can go wrong. Um, and then it was also important for us to have um, visible security, and I don't mean visible on the ground, but visible to our funders um, in the UK and to projects that might, might want to par partner with us, because particularly when we were formulating uh, these quest the project back in 2000 and, um, late 2016, early 2017, the war against Daesh still wasn't finished. People were still fighting in Mosul, and it was really important to signal very, very clearly that we would make ourselves safe and we would protect everybody else. So the Brit there's a Brit very good British security firm called Pilgrim's Group who've been working in Iraq since 2003. Um, Lee Tiplady um, and um, uh, this is uh, Khaldun um, Mohammed, who is really the, sort of the main guy on the ground and sort of, uh, does all our sort of logistics in country. But in fact, they're very, very low-key. Their idea of, of security is to basically um, blend in. And they're not the sort of people that insist on body armour and guns and silly protection, which is um, very important. So, let's come back to what we're actually doing. 
Our aim, as I said, is to bring together two what have often been thought of as two very different things, the academic study of antiquity, history, heritage, and the humanities more generally, and think about how we can use this for the, for the, the good of Iraq, and um, in particular in the context of this massive population growth and all the problems that come in the, with the post-conflict society, with corruption, with serious agricultural um, damage, all the water security problems that they're having at the moment. So they're facing massive, massive problems, and, and it seemed only right if we could just do a little bit to help that. So our, our, our title, our name, comes, of course, from the Arabic um, word for two rivers and, and points to the idea that Mesopotamian history, the history of the land of two rivers, is also local history, but it also has these two streams which we hope to join together. So, as good historians, we're historicising, trying to understand how things have got into this mess in particular. I've talked about raising profile, giving uh, colleagues voices, helping them with their own students and getting students into jobs, into good jobs, advocating with uh, employers about what humanities graduates can do, helping museums, libraries, archives, archaeological sites work better for, for local people, and then think about what all this means in a post-conflict setting. And originally I had very sort of highfalutin ideas about the past as a safe space for thinking about healing and reconciliation. But in fact, it's become increasingly clear that a lot of the time people just want to use heritage and history and, and the arts as a, as a way to forget all their worries for a while and just enjoy intellectual stimulation, aesthetic stimulation, um, tranquility, all of those things that we ourselves enjoy when we um, engage with these sorts of activities. So here's Paul at the art. Yeah, this is one of these sort of fateful, at uh, that fateful Basra conference, and we were at um, in a heritage house in uh, downtown Basra, looking at um, a little local display of, of of local art, and that really sort of encaps this image. Really sort of encapsulates for me a lot of the, the things that we were fumbling towards at the time, that time, and are now trying to realise. So we're obliged to think about the UN Sustainable Development Goals. There are lots of them. There are several that we're interested in. And in fact, for Iraq, it's pretty easy because we're looking at um, supporting young people, um, women and minorities. Um, there's a particular focus uh, in the UN around uh, people who live in the countryside. A lot of our archaeological sites and heritage sites are in the country. And then this whole question of social co cohesion in, in post-conflict communities. So a lot of that is there. And so for us, it really wasn't, it's really not hard to, to um, think about these things. So the framework of our project, we were obliged by our funders to, um, to think in three strands which kind of interlink, so strands rather than phrases. This first strand, which we began back in October, is really kind of the scoping. Who's out there? What the possibilities? Who was capable of... of and interested in doing this work, how do we make the case for it, how do we find out about people that we don't already know about, how, not just in Iraq, but also in the UK. And now we've just embarked very, very recently on becoming an awarding fund, uh, grant awarding body ourselves, this is part of our remit. We've got £800,000 to hand out to, for other people to do research on, in these areas. And we've, we are just in the process of making those first awards. We've made the first decisions, but I can't tell you what they are yet because we, ha we haven't sent the letters out. They should have gone out um, yesterday, but um, hiccups with trains and boring things like that just meant that, yeah, yesterday's work day was a bit of a disaster. So I can't tell you because the, the people, the, the happy recipients themselves don't know yet, but that will come soon. And then because the project is about sustainability, we ourselves have to be self-reflexively sustainable. And you can see this map is not just about Iraq, it's about... It shows Iraq's neighbours too. And one of the important things about sustainability and breaking down isolation 
is also for helping Iraq make local regional connections as well. So our remit as from next year will expand to include uh, neighbouring countries. So what are we doing? Um, we are setting, in the pro slow process of setting up a research centre for the sustainable development of cultural heritage. That's at um, a Kurdish un uh, government-funded university in Erbil, an English language university, um, uh, led by the head of the School of Social Sciences, Dr. Anwar Anaid, who is an expert, uh, again, not in cultural heritage per se, but in um, the politics of development and sustainability and um, um, sort of regional governance. We're currently recruiting for a three-year postdoc there. If you know of anybody who would be interested in researching the sociology or the anthropology or the politics of sustainable, sustainability and cultural heritage in the Middle East, then you've got three weeks to apply. Um, so that's really, yeah, thinking about what, how, how heritage and history, etc., all the stuff about the past, can work in, in the future. Um, and then we've beg we began our sort of scoping and networking and partners partnership exercises back in December. Uh, here's Mehia and then Saad behind a very big microphone um, delivering the second of a series of two focus groups for the, region the directors of the regional so-called uh, cultural houses, Dar al Turath, in the um, Iraqi Ministry of Culture. So Saad and his great network, he brought together... I think 30 in total, managers of these local branches where they're, they're responsible for delivering culture to, to local towns and cities. They have funding for their own salaries, but they don't have any funding for networking, for sharing ideas with each other, and they're struggling, or they were struggling over the winter, to get their voices heard in the post-conflict reconstruction conversations in local government, which were all about not surprisingly, under, understandably, about material infrastructure and reconstruction of roads and bridges and schools and hospitals, all of which is absolutely necessary, but the social and cultural aspects of rebuilding a city, rebuilding a community, what, what is going on there? So Saad and Mehiar, um, Saad in particular was leading that, and then Mehiar and I came in for the second of the, of the sort of follow-up workshops, which is really about helping... Um, helping those people find language um, for advocacy and, f and helping on the very practical things about finding money and writing fun uh, funding applications. Back in the... Um, and then we were doing some more um, advocacy and uh, on the one hand and academic things on the other. So the Iraqi um, Minister of Higher Education um, came to visit uh, London in uh, January we took him to our partners at the British Library, thank you, Daniel, and to um, the National Archives, and here you can see Juliet. So um, both Daniel and Juliet got at the highlights of their collections of Iraqi-related stuff. And Juliet has a particular interest in, um, in uh, mandate Iraq, so she had lots of amazing documents about the way uh, the British mandate were treating heritage letters from Gertrude Bell, maps of archaeological sites, which is what we're looking at here, we're looking at um, um, maps around Mosul, etc. And then more or less at the same time, Paul was uh, at a really important conference on the future of cultural heritage in Iraq, held um, at the University of Kufa, and he was introducing the project there. So again, sort of getting the message out about what we're doing. There is other things going on, but I think another highlight I'd want to flag um, in April, um, Letters from Baghdad, another um, very a project close to Bizi's heart. We were, um, as you rem remember, we were some of the first people to see it ever in the world, but the directors have been struggling to get it to Iraq itself. And because this documentary is about Gertrude Bell, about the foundation of Iraq itself, and um, about the relationship between the construction of the country and the construction of its heritage. The directors, uh, Ziva Elmbaum and uh, Sabina uh, um, Kreyenbu, had wanted very much for a long time to take the film to uh, Iraq. So this was a great idea of Saad's to make this happen. With the Ministry of Culture again, we showed it, had a big sort of screening of it um, in the National Theatre. 
with subtitles funded by uh, the British Council Iraq in Arabic, um, and there'll be screenings across um, Iraqi Kurdistan later this summer. So that was very important. Uh, so that's really about getting our message out, but we're actually kind of doing core research as well. Uh, and we have, we're starting in se sort of several places and working out, like sort of dropping stones in a pond. So my own work as a nerdy cuneiformist is really thinking about how nerdy cuneiform can um, deliver the next generation of researchers who are properly skilled in local ancient history and how those general skills of language, uh, history, um, managing complex data, presenting complex arguments, etc., are going to help graduates who are not going to become professional academics. So thinking very much with the, um, the College of Arts in the University of Baghdad, not just the archaeologists and the ancient historians. And we've been, um, we nearly had a, a, a workshop on digital humanities in Baghdad last spring, but we're now trying to reschedule it for this autumn. Um, and that's really important, those basic sort of fundamental skills, and thinking about how teachers can better deliver what they want to deliver to their students. Paul, meanwhile, is working with um, Basra Museum, with Khartan Al-Abid, and with friends of Basra Museum, thinking about engage, how the museums can work for local um, people, um, how they can engage with academic communities, what their relevance is in, in the uh, future. So the next event is not going to be in Basra itself, but uh, a workshop at a conference in, um, in Karbala in August, where Paul... Um, and uh, Dr. Jafar Jothari from the University of Cardassia will be running um, a focus group for lots of local museum managers. So it's a bit like the thing that Saad and Mechiar did um, for the, uh, the managers of the Dar al-Taraf, of bringing lots of um, people together and getting them talking sort of peer-to-peer -peer and establishing networks and thinking about their problems, their opportunities, helping them think a little bit more about what's going on there. And then, of course, when we, as I said, when we started, the war in Mosul was still raging. Just as we were putting in the, the final application, Mosul was liberated, and I um, was able to establish contact with my colleagues at the University of Mosul there. Um, and that has turned into what I, is a rather fabulous initiative, um, working very closely with UNESCO Iraq, on their Revive the Spirit of Mosul initiative. So they have lots of international funding, for the, again, for material construction, because that's what all the international uh, donors want to fund. But UNESCO are just as interested in the, 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 the historical questions, the social questions, questions of um, community um, and diversity and collaboration and cooperation. But also, I was thinking about the universities as you know, the, the, the knowledge creators of the future. So we're working with them very closely with the university and with UNESCO and all that sort of social and historical aspects of what heritage does, what heritage has meant. Um, so I'm um, chairing a session at a, the UNESCO working um, meeting early July on Mos Maslari history. Um, we'll be running uh, more focus groups in Mosul itself, uh, hopefully in, in early September. And we, as you'll see, we're already fun funding some Maslaris. The other new thing, which I don't have quite as much time to talk about because we started late, is again another entity that didn't exist when we started. Well, the University of Mosul existed, but it was completely out of contact but certainly didn't exist when we started. And that is an incredible new um, entrepreneurial, uh, co-working, collaborative, collective thing. Difficult to describe it exactly. It doesn't, because there's nothing quite like it. Um, it's basically a group of really energetic and intelligent and visionary young men and women in Baghdad who have got themselves really a fantastic funding through a coalition of Iraqi banks to create what they call the station, or Mahatta, where tech, tech entrepreneurs, artistic um, creators, cultural thinkers come together and sort of share space and share ideas very much. And they're the first people really to kind of to break out 
of the very state institution top-down system that um, uh, Iraq is very sort of it's very characteristic of Iraq. And the leader of that sort of the cultural um, sort of zone of that is a young man called Ali Al Maksomi, who used to work for the Ministry of Culture. So together, he and I ran a, a quick workshop um, back in April, just after the um, the film premiere of how young people who are involved in various ways in heritage, so some of them are professional, uh, working professionally in heritage, some of them are academics, some of them are just interested but kind of invo invested personally and how they underst understand what heritage means to them and where they see possibilities for the future. And this was extraordinary. This was absolutely amazing event. So here are some of the people, and I want to read... I've only got time to, to read one. I basically, I was, I asked, I started off, Ali and I started off by asking them, when did you first become aware of, 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 of heritage and what does heritage mean to you? None of them said, I learned it at school. So I'm going to tell you about Shema, who is just at the edge of the um, thing. Here she is, she's looking at, at Dina, who's off here, showing off um, something. Um, but all of the men and women had their say. We were speaking in a mixture of English and Arabic. I recorded everything and so <coughs> transcribed it. Unfortunately, the recording is very faint, so you'll have to, you'll have to put up with me um, ventriloquizing Shema. So she's talking about her childhood. So she talks first about her father's res responses and then her mother's, and then sort of reflecting on all that, all that means. So this is all her words in English. She was speaking in English. We used to have picnics across all of Iraq. We went to mountains, places that no one had ever seen. I remember my father always liked to drive. We'd get in the car, take some lunch and go. Even down streets that didn't have names, didn't know where they went to, we visited them. I have lots of memories about Babel. But unfortunately, my father never told us stories about them. No, it was just picnics. But he did give us a love of travelling. He loved scientific things. He loved our studies, but he never, never told us about history. He never let us learn about history from books, or let's say from the government at the time, I think she means schools. But he always said, just go and see stuff, and then think about what it is. My mum is different. My mum always says, you're girls, you have to stay in the house. You have to learn how to sew, how to cook, and how to clean. And all the women are laughing at this point. But the heritage that we took from her was the stories that we heard from our grandfathers, grandmothers, and our families, the stories that were said long ago. But now, now I understand why they did it like that and how they did it. It's very simple. They never explained it to us. But I remember what they did, and so now I do it too by default. And again, everyone laughs and agrees. I know that's the right thing to do, and it's something I feel. But it's never, never, never explained. That's wrong, and I think that's the biggest obstacle we have. They didn't have explanations like we do now. They didn't talk about stuff like we do now. They do think, but they never talk about it. But we have to find our voice. We have to give, well, I don't know how to say it, but we have to give them words. We have to let people hear it and know it. So here she is, and this is the themes that ran across a huge variety of responses that it's about emotional responses to place of being in special places with people you love but also hearing stories from grandparents feature a lot but also just trying to find it out from yourself there are official channels don't work school is boring university is boring everybody says that so um, and then there are people who said, well, I knew nothing at all about it. It's not something my uh, family did at all. Um, and I'm coming back to it or learning for it as an adult. Um, so here's, um, there are two Husseins. So Hussein, Hussein in, the, in the black. Um, so he says, unfortunately, I don't have any memories of normal ch children for Iraqi culture. And that's because my childhood was outside Iraq. He grew up in Yemen. So I spent my learning years of my childhood outside Iraq, so I really wasn't familiar with the general ideas of culture. 
And I think most guys here took classes in history, in Iraqi history, but even then they didn't like it. So I don't think it's a matter of studying books, but we live culture and heritage in our lives. And then he goes on to talk about the fact he runs, he's, uh, runs a small business making streetwear, sort of hip T-shirts and, and baseball caps and things for the kids to wear. And so he talks about, you know, in our business we do revisit all of the heritage, all of the culture, everything that Iraqis can relate to, that they can consider and think of. In the past, you know, in the, in the present, we talk, the, in, even when we talk in street language, we started to introduce heritage into our products. And I'm actually learning, actually, every day I'm learning more about it. I'm busy with everything. So I haven't actually been to Amara. I haven't been to Mosul. I haven't been to the Iraqi Museum even. But I want to go there because I have a collection of Sumerian T-shirts that I'm working on. And I need inspiration. I think there's a lot of potential in the Iraqi culture. And I've be never been fortunate enough to see what it is in its entirety. But it's never too late to learn. I would really love to explore more. So these are two very, very different approaches. People who've, who've just felt it in their bones as children and grown up with it, um, like Shema, and people like Hussein, who come to it consciously, explicitly as adults. And then the conversation went on, we're, we're going to start thinking about how we can put these ideas into practice in meaningful ways. But talking about putting things into practice, let me finish off. And the last couple of minutes by talking about things that we are actually doing to make stuff happen. So, as I said, we are, our, our, our remit is to be a funding agency. With the British Institute for the Study of Iraq, we fund um, a visiting scholars program. It's an extension and a sort of big overlap with the existing BZ scheme. But the big difference, of course, that we have this sustainable um, development remit. So what we're not allowed to do, which BC can, is, is fund kind of pure research that doesn't have a sustainable element goal. But we do have a heck of a lot of money for it. We have money for 22-month uh, placements over the next three years. People can apply, whether they're working in universities or cultural heritage institutions or NGOs um, or sort of organisations like the state station, come to the UK either for projects that are um, deliverable in themselves or to test out longer term collaboration so we're initially working just with Iraq and it will always remain primarily about Iraq but because our remit is oh, excuse me, to, to, to be um, regional as from next year we'll be working with uh, busy system organisations to reach out um, certainly to um, to Lebanese and Turkish colleagues too and then we're having to think quite hard at the moment about the the practicalities, legalities, and ethics of the, uh, our original remit, but we'll see. So, we've already funded four people. Ali, whom you've met, who uh, runs a, a local tourism uh, company, and so he takes Baghdadis down to the marshes, to Ur, to Babylon, wants to start going uh, uh, up north, and will be here in the UK to help um, sort of learn more about how to do that effectively. Um, so that really is making local sites work for local people. Rajin Mohammed um, from Sulaymaniyah Polytechnic University is very interested in emotional res responses to um, museums. So the Sulaymaniyah Museum got refurbished with a big lot of money um, several years ago, but still nobody's really engaging with it. So she wants to think about what storytelling might do in a museum setting and there's a big project at the University of Glasgow called Emotive around this and she'll be working with them. Uh, and then Mohammed uh, Jassim al Haji Mohammed, um, you can see down here, he's the director of Mosul University <coughs> Libraries and he will be here to help really, gosh, this fundamental problem of the, the, the absolute non-existence of research resources in Mosul University. Um, Professor Nasser Jassim, who is a historian of Orient British Orientalism, he'll also be coming to, to think again to do this sort of historicising stuff. Almost penultimate slide. The big money is for um, collaborative research projects um, between uh, Iraqi and British researchers. So applicants, there must be at least one 
two, there must be at least two co-applicants, someone in a British institution and somebody in um, an Iraqi institution. The lead has to be, have a PhD or have equivalent standing, so they might have years and years of, of, of appropriate practice, for instance, instead of a PhD. But they've got to be capable of leading a research project, and the emphasis really is on research, to further our, our, our basic goals and to think about how all of these things can contribute to Iraq's future. So we are, as I said, imminently about to announce the first tranche of projects that we have funded. We are going to be funding more later this year, and then there will be two further rounds there. So I'd strongly encourage you to apply. So that is it. You can, if you're interested in getting involved, you can, we will still be running various workshops in our sort of work hubs. Come and talk to me or Paul about what you might do to help. Um, if you have someone you want to bring to the UK who might fit this remit, talk to my colleague Mehia about that. If you want to interested in collaborative grants along these things, again, we can talk about that. And you can just follow us on social media. We have big social media presence. Our website says everything. We've got a lot of stuff on Twitter. Uh, Mehia runs our Facebook, which is mostly for our Iraqi colleagues. He, we're just about to launch a podcast series, so podcasts are your thing. We've recorded two so far. Um, and they're not yet up, but they will be in the next week. We're just sorting out some, some hosting issues right now. So there's a lot going on, and there'll still be a lot going on over the next three years. So thank you for your patience. Sorry for the, the delay with the technical things. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Eleanor, thank you very much indeed for that tremendous overview. Um, I guess I'm the only other person in the room that knows um, who's been awarded the grants. Um, there is a little time for a few questions here. Of course, we'll invite you all to join us in the reception afterwards. Um, but if anybody has any pressing questions for Eleanor, perhaps we can take one or two now. So. Um, Program of... Is that on? Yes, I can hear you. Subhi Azawi, architect. Would your um, research program support publications about Iraq? Particularly no. architecture heritage. Um, so, we don't, we're not a publication program. We obviously, we fund research projects and that we expect them to publish their results, but we are not a publisher. Okay, so we don't publish books. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, um. yeah, as an old bureaucrat, I'm interested in how this actually works. There's presumably an executive secretary or secretariat at UCL. Do you then find you can operate entirely by email or do you have to have regular meetings, irregular meetings, ad hoc meetings? How does it actually work? So, yeah, so our, um, so our core team of me, Paul, Mehia and Anwar uh, meet by Skype every two weeks, 10 o'clock on a Tuesday morning. We have a management committee that convenes <coughs> um, every quarter. Uh, at the moment we've been convening at UCL and... <coughs> Anwar and Louise and our Iraqi colleagues coming in by Skype, but in future we could be in Erbil and the, the, the UK people coming in by Skype. So we're not, we use technology a lot, we don't need to do face to face, but all the time. But as you've guessed, you've probably seen from that, I travel a lot, Paul and Mehia travel not quite so much. Now that this initial setup is calming down, we, I, hopefully my, my travel schedule will get a little calmer. Um, but it is important to meet people face to face. <coughs> particularly for advocacy um, but for the actual mechanics the core team we know each other well enough that you know, we, can, we can do it by screen but seeing people matters even if we can't touch them sorry let me just take a glass of water I've suddenly got a frog in my throat <coughs> is there sufficient provision within the overall programme for the teaching of English to these prospective students. So I know in the case of the Basra Museum, uh, the problem has been that the staff who come forward yeah. to avail themselves of 
uh, the expertise uh, don't have uh, the, uh, sufficient ability to follow in English. Well, um, so two, two answers to that. Yeah, so the, the official development assistance budget is really not for, for English language, so we can't fund that. But I also think it's actually, it's on us to deliver stuff in Arabic too. So that workshop I did was bilingual and I got by with my... <laughs> Interestingly, yeah, better than it was, Arabic, and they, <coughs> so people spoke in whatever language they were comfortable with, <coughs> the fully bilingual participant, <coughs> I can't even speak in English now, excuse me, translated ad hoc, so we work a lot with translators, um, and so a lot of the people who are involved are sort of bilingual and bicultural. And that was really, that's really important to us. So, um, so we have, you know, of our core team, um, Mehia is, is Arabic English bilingual, Anwar is Kurdish English bilingual. So we produce a lot of our, um, our documentation in Arabic and we will be increasingly in Kurdish. Um, for the visiting scholarships program, they have to have good enough English to function in the UK but we don't expect people working in Iraq to speak English. They can speak in their own language. And that is really precisely one of the things I feel incredibly strongly about, that local history should be in local languages. You wouldn't expect to have to learn Japanese in order to read about the archaeology of Stonehenge, for instance. So, yeah. So I think it's on me to improve my Arabic. And it's a great incentive to do it. I'm loving it, I should say. Eleanor, what has been the biggest surprise from starting this project for you? Sorry? What has been the biggest surprise in terms of how the interpretation, you know, from the Iraqi side? What On the Iraqi been? side? Um, that's interesting. I've had some shocks at the UK. <laughs> um, I think, yeah, going back, that workshop, that workshop I did in April, I was just blown away by how articulate and thoughtful those young men and women were, and articulating ideas that academics working on the meaning of cultural heritage have taken decades to get through serious academic research, and they just live it and breathe it and, and can speak it, not in any sort of jargon-laden way, but this sense. I mean, it's taken sort of cultural heritage studies a long time to get to the point that actually it's about emotion and... and and people and, and feelings and not just about restoring lovely buildings and putting up plaques. You've got to feel it. And, you know, they get that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that was incredibly... Because, you know, frankly, some of the meetings... You, you know, I spent a lot of time in meetings with ministers, with diplomats. And that's all well and good, and we spent a lot of time talking. But often feels like it doesn't get... That's very far. It's important to raise the profile. But with... Ali's group, I thought, yeah, okay, this is the future and there is real hope for the country with people this bright and this committed. I mean, it was really, you know, I, I, I left thinking, oh, it was, it was just amazing, humbling. So perhaps just one more question, I think, before we can wrap up. So, um, so try, well, head for that side, sorry. Thank you very much for your presentation. It, it, do you see the possibility of a flowering of that, of course, that appreciation of, of history and culture in the building of the future history and culture of the country, so rebuilding particular precincts around core cities? That's a huge question, of course. As, as the city rebuilds, or, or rather cities rebuild in Iraq... Do you see the, the feeling, of course, for history and culture in historical sites and, and oh, yeah. clear historical centres blossoming into a discussion about actually how to build other places besides or in addition to the, those very clearly identifiable places of culture? Yeah, I mean, culture is many, um, heritage is many different things to many different people. We tend to label certain things as being culturally important, but my view is very much heritage is what people make, it, make of it. And so, uh, you know, whether it's, you know, the, the amazing modernist uh, office buildings of downtown Baghdad or, or an archaeological site or just a, 
traditional life ways in the marshes, all of this matters, and people feel it and it means a lot to them. Not to everybody, I mean, there are always people that just want to knock things down and build, build new. Um, but the point is to allow a multiplicity of voices to be heard and for the commercial interest not to drown everything out all the time. And that's the big issue right now. Um, and to, yeah, to retain the, 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 the socially meaningful value of, of heritage and the plurality of it, I think that's really, really important. And the decision should be made at local level and not by outsiders deciding what matters. Great, thank you very much, Eleanor. I think if we could save other questions for Eleanor at the reception, mm. but I'd like to invite Dr. Sarah Savan to just give the voice of... Good. Uh, well, I'd just like to say that I'm, I'm Sarah Savant. I'm an associate professor at the Aga Khan University, and I run a digital humanities project um, that I'm very much hoping to attend in October um, to present. Uh, it's, it's extremely exciting, Eleanor, I think, to see the way in which you're engaging with issues of heritage in such a complex but yet simple way. And um, I, for, I think for my own work, I work on the medieval period, thinking a, a lot about the issues of how material that we work on is meaningful to people today can be really, really challenging. And um, I was very struck by your focus group where you've, you've asked, I mean, you just asked the question and you've listened. And communicating that, I think, in the years to come will be really important, um, both in Iraq, allowing Iraqis to speak for themselves and also internationally. So I'm hoping that actually this can be more than just about Iraq, in fact. It can really do a lot for how we think about heritage broadly, particularly in the Middle East. Um, so. I'd just like to thank Eleanor very much um, for her for talk um, on behalf of council. I should have said I'm a member of council. And um, yes, and to invite, I think, everyone to thank Eleanor, to thank you for attending, and to invite you to reception. Thanks. Thank you. So there's, there's a reception outside, and yeah, okay. please join us.